he is the Earl S. Collin Professor of Old Testament and Semitic Languages at Denver Seminary. He's also the editor of the Denver Journal, which is our online journal of book reviews and bibliographies. And he has earned a PhD from Hebrew Union College and an MDiv and a THM from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and a BA from Wheaton. He has authored eight books, including Volumes on Religion, which is Israelite Religions, a Biblical and Archaeological Survey, Ancient Near Eastern Subjects, and Commentaries on Leviticus, Joshua, and the Song of Songs. He's edited 13 books, most recently collections of studies on war in the Bible and terrorism in the 21st century, issues in Bible translation, and the family in the Bible, and commentaries on the Septuagint texts of Genesis and Joshua. In addition to several hundred book reviews and dictionary articles, Dr. Hess has published more than 100 scholarly articles and collected essays and journals, such as Biblica, Biblio, Biblical Archaeologist, Bulletin for Biblical Research, Catholic Biblical Quarterly, Themelios, Tyndale Bulletin, Vetus Testamentum, and Zigschrift. I'm not going to even say, try and say that as a journal. Current research projects include commentaries on the, book of Genesis, the books of Genesis and Kings, an introduction to the Old Testament, Hebrew grammar, and the study of ancient Near Eastern texts related to the Old Testament. So you can see now why we consider this a, a real treat to have him here. And I will now invite Dr. Hess up to teach us. Thanks very much. It's very nice to be here. Uh, I guess the really important part about me is that I'm a Christian and a father and a grandfather of five grandchildren, all under the age of six. So that's really nice. And, uh, we, they live right near here, so we get to see them every week. My wife and I also co-pastor a small church plant called 316 that meets on Saturday evenings, which devotes itself to Celtic Christianity. And uh, last night we, we were involved in helping uh, homeless, and uh, so I didn't get quite as much sleep as I might have liked, but I think I'm awake, and so uh, we'll, we'll try to uh, plunge right into this. I hope you all were able to pick up a set of uh, these notes out uh, just as you came in, if not, I believe there's some still there uh, on the red chair. So, uh, what I want to do this, uh, this morning, rather, is talk about this whole question, can we trust the Old Testament, which is a really big question because there's a, a thousand different ways to approach this, and uh, the question is how to do that. And so, what we're going to look at is one particular aspect, not the whole thing, and maybe you'll have some questions about that or other things if we have opportunity for questions at the end of this hour. The, and, and this was true when I went uh, first uh, began teaching at Denver Seminary. Uh, there are courses uh, that talk about the Bible and its inspiration, 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 1.21, and some of the other texts that talk about how the Bible is the Word of God. That's very important. I understand you'll be uh, looking at that later on in this series. And then there are lots of classes we have that deal with the content of the Bible, kind of where the rubber meets the road. What does this mean? What, is it, what did it mean in ancient times and what does it mean for today? But somewhere in between those two matters, there's the, the, the sort of missing link. Uh, and that is the question of, how do we know that this thing that we're using is the same thing uh, and that we're studying is the same thing, this Bible, is the same one that uh, was originally the one that was uh, written by the people who claim to have written it. How do we know that we can trust that it hasn't been uh, distorted or changed or something else? What evidence do we have for that? Now that itself has kind of two questions. Because there's the whole question about how do we know that these are the right books and that there aren't, shouldn't be some other books. And that's a question that uh, maybe we can address at another time because I'm not going to talk about that. I don't have the time this morning. But uh, that's one question. The other issue which we are going to look at is how do we know that the actual words that we're reading and looking at when you open your Bibles has any relationship what uh, appears specifically the Old Testament. 
to what and the claim is that Moses wrote these or Isaiah wrote them or other prophets of the Old Testament wrote them. Do we have any evidence for that or is it simply something that we take on more or less blind faith? So that's what I want to look at and to look at that there's a couple things that uh, I have here called definitions, just meanings of words because I will begin throwing around a variety of different words, not uh, because I like to do that, but just because that's uh, part of the way people talk when they talk about these issues. And I just wanted to deal with a few of those definitions right off. We think, uh, I think most of you still know what a book is. I know we have Kindle and lots of other things now and electronic media, but uh, I don't have a book up here, do I? Uh, but most of you do, and you bring, uh, perhaps bring a Bible or something like that. Well, the idea of a book is, 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 has not always been with us. In fact, when the Old Testament was written, it was written, of course, with scrolls that you rolled around back and forth uh, to get from one section to another. And the sense of a book only really, uh, or the invention of a book and its use, only really emerges after the time of Christ, maybe uh, in the second century and third centuries AD. And so, uh, and then they began to use books because they found them much more useful than a scroll. Of course, if you're at the beginning of a scroll and want to see what's at the end, you've got to work your way through a lot of rolling of that scroll. Whereas with a book, you simply turn all the pages up once and there you are at the end of the book. And that is, in the old term for a book was codex. That's the Latin term and that's... Uh, you'll see some of the things we're looking at this morning are named Codex So-and-So. The reason for that is because it's an early book. Some of the very earliest books we have actually are Bibles, as we'll see. And so uh, this is actually historically significant as the very earliest books that we have in existence today. Um, Hebrew. Hebrew is sometimes used in two ways. One way is it refers to a group of people commonly known as the Jews, are sometimes called Hebrews, uh, or the Hebrew race, or things like this. Uh, that's not how I'm going to use the term. I want to use the term in terms of the language that was spoken and written during the Old Testament times. The people of God, ancient Israel, uh, wrote in the language known as Hebrew and with a script no, uh, that, that was uh, distinctive for them, known as Hebrew. In fact, there are two. There's an early one, an old script, and then a later one, which we'll, we'll talk about briefly. Manuscript. A manuscript is quite simply anything that I can hold in my hand that's written. This is a manuscript. A book is a manuscript. A manuscript is something that exists. You can either see it sometimes in a museum or in a library, or you, uh, or it once did exist and people are writing about it and reporting it because they have seen it. But a manuscript is very important because, of course, those are the things in which the Bible was written, those manuscripts from the very first generation of the very first writers up until today we have. And uh, we don't have the first generation, but we do have some of the later copies of that first manuscript, which are themselves manuscripts. The Masoretic Text. The Masoretic Text is a fancy name because it goes back to describe a group of Jewish scholars and scribes who copied the Bible generation after generation uh, very carefully. And these were known as the Masoretic. So they wrote in the Hebrew script and the Hebrew language, and they copied it, especially about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 years ago. From around the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries AD, they copied it. That's very important because the very oldest whole Bibles we have in Hebrew are those Masoretic uh, texts. And every Old Testament translation that you have into English, every English translation of the Old Testament is based on those Masoretic manuscripts. So uh, they're important. We'll look more at that as we move forward uh, through this 
tour of uh, ancient manuscripts. Uh, and that's written in Hebrew, which is the language that most of the Old Testament was written in. There are a few sections of the Old Testament, in, particularly in Ezra and in Daniel, that are written in a very closely related language known as Aramaic. But most of it's written in Hebrew, and that's sometimes why people even call it the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. The other uh, term that is good to know about is something called the Septuagint. Um, the Septuagint is the very first translation of the Bible. Of course, uh, it wasn't first translated into English, it was first translated into Greek. Sometime around 275 B.C., in uh, the main capital city of Egypt, actually, which at that time was Alexandria in Egypt, a, uh, a ruler by the name of Ptolemy, second Ptolemy Philadelphia, as he's sometimes called, uh, assembled a group of Jewish scribes from nearby Jerusalem and brought them there and asked them to translate the first five books of the Old Testament into Greek, from the Hebrew, into the Greek. Now this is the, this is the sort of legend or history that is uh, uh, how it was, how it happened. And it probably something like that happened, but the actual story is only told in a letter that dates from about 150 years later. So you, it's important to be aware of that. But something like that probably happened around 275 BC, and the Bible was translated into the Old Testament was translated into Greek, at least the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then over the next century, probably every other book of the Old Testament was translated into Greek. Some in Egypt, maybe some elsewhere, we don't know. We just don't know that information. But by the time that the New Testament comes around, the time of Christ, uh, when Jesus walked the earth, all of the Old Testament is translated in Greek. And when the apostles and others wrote the New Testament, they tended to use that Greek translation of the Old Testament because they wrote their New Testaments in uh, they wrote the New Testament in the Greek language. So that's very important. It's the very first translation of the Bible, and it's also preserves for us and has for us some very ancient manuscripts. In fact, the first whole Bible, the earliest whole Bible, as we will see in a codex, in a book, is from is in Greek. Okay, and now we get into this term textual criticism. Um, textual criticism exists in Christianity and in Judaism simply because we have a lot of ancient manuscripts. We have an embarrassment of riches, as some would say. Hundreds, even thousands of ancient manuscripts of the Bible that record readings of the Bible. Not all complete Bibles, some only a verse or two, some more. But they all record uh, sections of the Bible, and they don't all agree. For a given verse, uh, there may be, for example, Genesis 1.1 says in one translation, in the beginning God created heavens and the earth, or in, in one manuscript, in most actually, and, but in some others it may say when in the beginning God created heavens and the earth. That's called a variant, a difference in reading. And the reason this thing called textual criticism exists, it's a sort of a science and an art, is because we have more than one ancient manuscript and they don't all agree in every reading of every part of the Bible. So the purpose of textual criticism is to do two things. Number one, it is to record and keep a record, make a record, of all the ancient manuscripts and every difference of a reading. Now, in most cases, they're very minor, but nevertheless, that's what some scholars do. They seek to record every difference of every manuscript we have of the Old Testament, in this case. And they do the same in the New Testament. Um, that's the first thing. And then the second thing they do is to evaluate or weigh the difference Variants, the different readings, to try to understand how those differences came about. And in the process of doing that, they determine what is the more original or ancient reading. 
Now that is to some extent a bit subjective. The first thing, cataloging and simply noting all the ancient manuscripts is pretty objective. You, people can check you on that and you, you have to do it. It's long and tedious, but it's essential. And then the second one is a bit more of working out now is A, reading A, more likely than reading B. And, and in order to determine that, you determine whether it's easier to explain how A became B by mistake, scribe made a mistake, or is it easier to explain how B became A by that mistake. And uh, as you look at that, then you, uh, a, a, a person tries to argue which is the more original reading. Assuming there was one manuscript from one author at the beginning. Now that's an important area, and you should be aware that not in every religion or faith of, uh, related to books does that take place. For example, in Islam, there is no such thing as textual criticism. About the second or third generation of caliphs after Muhammad, uh, the caliph decided that he would bring, call in all of the Qurans, all of the different uh, Qurans, and he simply destroyed all but one. And that one became the standard in Islam. So they don't have any varied texts like you have in Christianity uh, and Judaism because they destroyed all at one point. But Christianity and Judaism recognized from the beginning that people are fallible. Scribes, even the most careful, can make mistakes. And so it's very important to hold on to every fragment that we have as precious because it is God's Word. And to study them the best we can to try to understand what the original text was. Uh, so this morning, uh, is all we have time to do is look at some of the major manuscripts. The first part of those two two steps to textual criticism. We aren't going to value it. But we're going to look at some of the major ones, and I'm going to make some observations about it. And what I will argue that uh, is that where we can check it, the Old Testament has preserved an accuracy of copy, especially in the Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament, has preserved an accuracy of an accurate copy that is really almost, uh, well, it's almost unbelievable, the degree of accuracy. So let's say there are no variants or no errors, but those are easy to recognize, and they are pretty clear where they are and what the original was, because the accuracy in the copy, where it can be checked, is remarkable. So let's get into that. We're going to start by looking at the Hebrew manuscripts, and then we'll turn and look as we have time at the Greek ones, which are the two major ones that exist. And as we look at these, we will talk about them and uh, what they, a little bit of what they are and mean and contain. Now the very earliest text of the Old Testament that we have, that you can actually go and look at, today it's in the Israel Museum, is this one. Um, is there any chance of turning off some of these lights up here? I don't think you can really uh, see too well. Is there anyone here operating the lights? Uh, that, that's not a big question. We can get the lights off of me in this area up here. That would be good so that we can see this one. Anyway, uh, what you see here, if you can see it, it almost looks like a fortune cookie. It's, uh, and that's about the size of what I have right here, and from top to bottom. And uh, that is a corroded piece of silver. That's great, thanks. A corroded piece of silver that's wrapped up in, uh, and, and this was found in 1979 in excavations at a site called Ketet Nom. It's really in Jerusalem. It's just west of uh, the old city, the ancient city, the city of David, of, of Jerusalem, where uh, Old Testament times people lived. And if you, to the west of that, and, and to the west of what today is the old city, there's a valley called Hinnom Valley. 
Today they have jazz concerts there and other things. But in, uh, in ancient times, this was, uh, uh, this was what was called Gehenna. Geh meaning simply valley of and henna, henna. And uh, of course, that's where we get the word hell and things like that from uh, uh, in the New Testament sometimes used that way. But uh, it was used for burning trash and other things uh, in ancient times. Well, this is Ketef, you know, it's actually mentioned in the Bible uh, uh, as the border of Jerusalem in, uh, in Joshua. Uh, Ketef simply means shoulder. It's the shoulder of Hinnom. You know, as you come up out of the valley, it's just a shallow, small valley, or dip there, really. And as you come up out of that, uh, is the shoulder. And on that shoulder, there are tombs dating from, the, from around 600 BC. Today, they're on the grounds of the Scottish church there. And in those tombs, uh, which were excavated back in the 70s, and it's 1979, sort of by accident, an interesting story, but anyway, uh, the excavator, uh, Gabriel Barkai, uh, found two of these in the tombs from around 600 BC, just before the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And when he unrolled them, which you had to do very carefully, you can see this is what was found. And of course, on either side, on the edges, it's all worn, as you would expect. That's where the wearing would take place. But right in the middle is preserved on a silver strip letters. Those letters are ancient Hebrew, old Hebrew from before the destruction of Jerusalem. It was written in this way. And you'll see some of the later manuscripts and the letters are look very different uh, because it changes. Uh, after the uh, uh, exile, after the destruction of Jerusalem, people return in the times of Haggai and Zechariah and Ezra and Nehemiah in the 5th century B.C. and so forth. Uh, it's no longer written like this. Hebrew is written differently. The script is written differently. But this is the old script that uh, for most of the Old Testament period was used. And that text is a text of part of Numbers 6, 24 to 26, which is the blessing of the high priest Aaron, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may the Lord cause his faith, uh, lift up his countenance, uh, excuse me, cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, and the Lord lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace. That's part of that text is found on both of these scrolls, and possibly some have tried to identify a bit of uh, Deuteronomy 7 as well. But the point is, this is the earliest text we have from around 600 BC, and actually the style of writing is another half century earlier. So this may have been an heirloom, excuse me, preserved and kept, and then buried with someone who found it special for them, uh, written on silver and scratched on, basically, this text from Numbers. And it's the earliest biblical text we have that you can, it is an actual manuscript, you can go and see it. Now, why don't we have more manuscripts from the Old Testament times when people actually wrote this stuff? Well, because most of the Old Testament manuscripts are big, I mean, the books are big, they would have been written on scrolls, and scrolls were made out of either papyrus, which grows in Egypt, and you can see the papyrus plant here, or out of animal skin called vellum. Those two elements are organic. An organic material in any climate that is the least bit moist disintegrates. Add to that all the wars and everything else that takes place in, uh, across ancient Israel and up to modern Israel, and there is no, there are no manuscripts left of the Bible or anything else that are of, uh, that are that are found on a scroll. The the material that would have been used to write the Bible, to write whole books of the Bible, that is. Uh, papyrus or vellum disintegrate. It no longer exists, uh, and we don't have it even in Jerusalem, which is a climate not unlike Denver, kind of desert mountain climate. But there's still moisture, as we now know from this last week, and you have that there too, and they don't remain for thousands of years, it just disintegrates. Uh, but where does it not disintegrate? Where are texts preserved for us? where it's extremely dry. It's absolutely dry, and they were able to hide them or bury them or something else so that nobody would find them. And of course, the most famous is the Dead Sea area. The Dead Sea area is very, very dry, and that's why the papyrus, the material in which the biblical texts there are written, 
is preserved for uh, it is preserved for two thousand years. It hasn't disintegrated. Um, this is part of what's called the Qumran community, uh, Kirbit Qumran. The name Qumran simply comes from the little wadi. That's a dry riverbed that when you get occasional storms, which is very rare, maybe even miles and miles away, the water flows through this riverbed uh, in a very sometimes violent fashion. But by and large, most of the time, 95% of the time, it's dry. And it happened that that riverbed is called Qumran in uh, modern Arabic. Uh, name, and that's why this community is called the Qumran community, and you're looking at what probably the pantry there uh, of the community. Uh, here you can see more of it. But these are the people who wrote and copied and preserved many biblical manuscripts between this between 200 BC and 70, 71 AD. Uh, and over that period of time, 270 years perhaps a little less, they recorded and they wrote copied biblical manuscripts. And it may be that when they knew that the Romans were coming and they had destroyed or were destroying Jerusalem right around 70 AD, and they would and did destroy this community, that they hid them in caves. The most famous is Cave 4, which you can see sits right above the wadi and is pretty inaccessible until it was found there. The story goes by a shepherd boy with his sheep looking for some uh, of his uh, flock in 1947. This cave was otherwise hidden. Now there are about 11 caves like this. When, they, when it was first found, uh, this cave, they found the shepherd boy and then he showed others presumably. In any case, some Bedouin in that area found these manuscripts and they began to show them to people in Jerusalem who knew what they were. And when they learned that they were valuable, of course, they combed this area and got all the major manuscripts from many caves that they found here. And then, of course, later the scholars came and they also then went into this area and began to look and look all over the Judean wilderness, in fact, for such manuscripts. But this is uh, Cave 4, from which a number of manuscripts have come. There are 11 altogether. This is Cave 11, and you can see there have been located in different places. This is a couple miles west of Qumran. The other one is right across the wadi from Qumran. And you can see that this is where they found many fragments and manuscripts. Upwards close to a thousand, not quite a thousand, maybe eight or nine hundred altogether, uh, separate scrolls. But the fragments, making those up, uh, are many, many more than that, many times that. And you must, or it's important to be aware when we talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, people think that, oh, they found dozens and dozens of complete scrolls. No, there's only one or two complete scrolls that were found. In most cases, we're only dealing with fragments. Sometimes uh, almost a scroll, but uh, pieces of it. At other times, they go right down until you've got about a letter. On a, on, a, on, a, on a fragment. It's that small. Um, and this is a reproduction of one and uh, some of the writing you can see on it, which is writing much closer to what we study now and that the Hebrew Bibles today are written in. It's a later script, as I mentioned, different from that Ketephanon, which is, is an anomaly. It's very unique because it was written scratched on silver, not on papyrus or, <clears throat> or vellum, like this is. In any case, here we have uh, uh, this kind of material that was found that many biblical books are written and recorded. The most famous, perhaps one of the most famous, is the Isaiah scroll. The Isaiah scroll uh, was found, and it's called 1Q Isaiah A, the great Isaiah scroll. Um, and you can see it today if you go to Jerusalem and visit the shrine of the book at the Israel Museum. They have a facsimile, the original they don't have because if they put light on it, it's, it's, very, it's uh, kept in dark in another museum, but if they put light on it, it begins to fade, and uh, they found this out. The ink with which these things are written actually fades over time, so that some of the early uh, photographs of these scrolls from around 47 to 48 actually are easier to read now than the scrolls themselves, uh, because in some cases that's what's happened. But the Isaiah scroll is unique. That size of a book is virtually the only scroll from Qumran that the whole book is preserved and nothing but the book of Isaiah.
Isaiah. Uh, and it's called 1Q because 1 stands for the cave where it was found, Q that was found in Qumran, and then IS, or a short form of Isaiah, and A is the first, that's the first one that they got a hold of. There's 1Q Isaiah B too, which is almost a uh, complete, or which is a partial scroll. As you can see, I mean, that doesn't look like what you normally think of when you think of a scroll. These are much more mutilated in terms of what we actually have preserved for us. But I want to point out these two. There are many more fragments of Isaiah uh, that have been found as well. But these are very important because when they found these and began to examine them, what they found was that letter for letter, word for word, there is uh, almost exact coincidence or exact parallel. Uh, they are exactly the same as the later texts of Isaiah that form the basis for our lives. And that over maybe a thousand years from when these were written about 100 BC, a copy, down to 1000 BC when we have the text that we use for our translation of the Bible. There is all of the, the differences are minor. 1 Q Isaiah B, there are five words missing and about six words added that are not found in the Bible that we use uh, in our book of Isaiah, in the Hebrew text of our book of Isaiah, over a thousand years later. Now, when you realize that this was before the invention of the printing press or anything like that, uh, it, is, it is remarkable. There's no other manuscript that can make that kind of claim. Um, you look at the classical manuscripts like Homer, there's maybe a dozen manuscripts, meaning the manuscripts of Homer preserved, and there are differences, significant differences. Um, this is always the case, but to have that precise of, uh, of a copy, especially one through Isaiah B, as it's called, and the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, text that we use in our Bibles are based upon, is remarkable. Um, there, I think, at the bottom of page one of the notes, I just mentioned a variety of different manuscripts that were found in Qumran and some of them. And, and basically what I'm saying is the Qumran people, and, and this was a group, um, it seems primarily men, uh, and it was a group that was a kind of fundamentalist religious sect that had uh, separated itself from the Jerusalem temple, from people like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, we know from the New Testament time, and had separated themselves off and regarded themselves as a pure group, holy and pure and everything else, and that they would eventually take over the temple and everything, and God would bless them and destroy everybody else. But the point is that this sectarian group is where we have these scrolls from. So it's important to remember that there may be reasons why this group might want to do certain things with the Bible. And in fact, they do. We, that's the reason why we have some texts like Isaiah. That's word for word. But we have other texts. For example, the Psalms, where the order of the Psalms is different. And there are some additional Psalms put in. And people have said, well, this shows all kinds of things, etc., etc. What actually doesn't. Because, uh, I don't know if you still have, a lot of churches still do, but you have hymn books. And if I go into your church and look at your hymn book, I'm willing to bet I can find in it, um, some of the hymns will be actually psalms that are taken right from the Psalter, but not all of them. There'll be a lot that are uh, composed by modern composers as well, in terms of who authored them. And that may well be what we have in the case of Qumran. That we have liturgical compositions, prayer books, other things, song books, hymn books that were used by this community. Uh, because it, there's, there's nowhere that the scrolls of the Psalms says this is a scroll of the Psalms or something like that. But we do also have whole books exactly of the Bible, like Isaiah. And so we do know that they knew how to preserve books like that, complete copies of Isaiah. <coughs> And uh, that's uh, one of the most dramatic finds. Now, around the Dead Sea, the, the, the Qumran community, if this is the Dead Sea, is located to the northwest, uh, just immediately northwest, a few miles of the Dead Sea. If you go south to an area sort of west of around the center of the Dead Sea, 
you come to this thing called Masada. Masada is a large butt sort of uh, uh, rise that just rises up and it's separate from all the surrounding uh, tableland. Remember, the Dead Sea is the lowest land, lowest spot on Earth, and everything rises dramatically. Between the 20 miles from the Dead Sea to Jerusalem, which is roughly 2,000 feet above sea level, you've got a dramatic increase of more than half a mile in height. So uh, things rise pretty fast, and this sits very close to the Dead Sea, uh, but it's a natural fortress at the top because there's no, no land connecting it. And at the very top of that uh, Masada is actually about sea level. So uh, Herod the Great built a palace there. And later on, the Jews who were uh, struggling against the Romans around 66 to 70 AD in the war with Rome, the, a, a number of them, about a thousand of them with their families, fled to Masada and lived there for a number of years and tried to preserve a community there. Now these people came more or less directly from Jerusalem and these were main line people in terms of their religious faith. They believed in the Bible, they weren't sectarian, they were very zealous for their uh, political convictions. But there they created a synagogue out of what were the remains of Herod's palace and that's one of the oldest synagogues that we have that is preserved for us today. There they also, uh, next to the synagogue, and it's kind of modernized today with little uh, statements and notes out front, but is, is a room in which they found scrolls that this community had buried, biblical scrolls, because this community was attacked by the Romans as well. And there's a famous story about when they knew that the Romans were going to enter in and they had built a, the Roman built a siege ramp up there in the army and were about to enter in, uh, the uh, inhabitants of Messiah took a pact and all committed suicide uh, rather than fall into the hands of the Romans. And, but the, before they did that, they buried their biblical scrolls. And those biblical scrolls, there are only a few of them, but there's one in the Psalms and a few of the other books of the Old Testament. Those are very close, again, where we can test them. They are very close to the Bible that we have in terms of the Hebrew text that's used. And it is a further piece of evidence of the care and precision of the copy. Now these two date from the first century AD, just like the Dead Sea Scrolls, which date from as early as 200 BC to 70 AD. These date from around 60, 50, 60, 70 AD, at least when they were used, they may have been copied earlier. So, these are a number of examples of 2,000-year-old scrolls that have been found in recent times, modern times, that bear witness to the biblical text. Then for our next major collection, we have to go to Cairo in Egypt. And in Cairo, there's an old part to the city, a very old part to the city, uh, including a Jewish synagogue, which goes back over 1,000, 1,500 years there. Um, the scaffolding in Bebe is renovation, and they also help to keep, keep it up because it's, uh, it, it has fallen apart when I visited it some years ago. But about 120 years ago, in this synagogue, they were vet renovating part of it. And as they were doing that, they came across a room that had been sealed for over a thousand years. That room, as they looked into it, they found many, many texts of the Bible and prayer books and other things that the Jews of a thousand years before had used. What happens in Judaism is that a text with the name of God written on it is considered sacred. And so when that wears out, you can no longer use it. You don't just throw it away, nor do you burn it, nor do you do anything else with it. You put it in us a place in the synagogue which is preserved for storing those old, worn-out books. And that's what and that's called a Geniza, hence the word Geniza. And that's what they did. They put these things and stored them, and then uh, many, many centuries ago, that Geniza was sealed up and forgotten about. And sure enough, as they renovated, they discovered this around uh, 1889, uh, roughly about that time in the 1890s. 
And uh, these manuscripts were then collected, and at that time, you could still do this sort of thing, they were actually moved to the uh, library in Cambridge, where they are now preserved. There's 100,000 fragments of these. Uh, this is the kind of manuscript and what it would look like, part of a text of Genesis, and uh, from the 6th century, 7th century AD. But these go and cover this period of the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries AD. And they show that the biblical text was continuing to be used and copied uh, the original, the Hebrew text. And so that's important to be aware of. And of course, they provide important comparisons to show something of the accuracy of the text. But even more important comes from the 8th and 9th and 10th century. And for this, we go to modern-day Israel. Look across the Dead Sea, and you're looking at the city, the modern-day city or town, really, of Tiberias. Tiberias lies at the more or less sort of western and a little bit southern coast of the Sea of Galilee, rather. This is the Sea of Galilee, looking across the Sea of Galilee. And it was there that a family known as the Ben Asher family in the 8th and 9th and 10th century BC uh, made their living at least in part by copying the biblical text of the Old Testament. And they copied it extremely carefully. They had all kinds of checks and balances by which to copy it so that they could be sure they had accurate manuscripts. And these are regarded as the very best manuscripts that we have of the Old Testament. Um, and this Ben Asher family, as well as a couple other families like that, together are called the Masoretes. It it's literally means sort of a group of counters, people who count, not just copy, but count the letters uh, in the manuscript. This is a page of a Masoretic text of the Bible. I don't have a pointer, so you have to try to imagine with me, but in the middle is the actual biblical text. Uh, that you see there. At the top it looks like partly poetry, the top half and the bottom half is more prose, just copied out. Now on either side, in the margins, you'll see little marks. Those are notations added by the masterpiece. And at the top and at the bottom, you'll see more little text, not as big as the biblical text, but smaller. Those are all notations <clears throat> that the mass reads added on every page of the Bible. Every word that appeared only once in the Bible because it had an odd spelling or because it was just a, uh, an unusual word, they made a note of it so that they would not miscopy it, assuming it was a more common word. If it appeared twice, they made a note that it appeared twice in the Bible. Every book of the Bible, they counted the number of letters in the book and made a note of that at the end. They marked where the middle letter was in the book. So that when a person was copying, they would be able to go back and check and double check to make sure that the text that they copied was exactly the text that was based on. There is a whole tradition, this is called the Masora, and the, the, the little notes on either side are the minor Masora, and the major Masora are the, are the larger pieces of top and bottom, which itself forms the whole book, as you can imagine. And that information was handed down generation after generation to guarantee, so that even where the scribes read a word or a phrase that they felt was obviously wrong, spelled wrong or grammatically wrong in the Hebrew, they copied it exactly that way. Now they may have made a, they made a note about it, but the note was in the size and in the margins, not in the text. And in this way, they guaranteed that the text, letter for letter, would be preserved generation after generation in these manuscripts. And so these are the manuscripts that form the basis, the, the, the Masoretic textual tradition. There in the middle of page 2, I mentioned it from AD 780 to 930 in Tiberias, especially the Ben Asher family, and in the decades after that. The, probably the, the, one of the best exemplars is called the Aleppo Codex. Because this codex, this book would be made, it would be copied, and then it would be sold to, uh, for a good amount of money because it takes a long time to make these things. But it would be sold, and it, maybe in this case directly, we don't know, but it found its way to the synagogue in Aleppo. And this is one of the best preserved manuscripts 
Now Aleppo, as you may know, is in Syria. And it was there for centuries until 1947 when Israel was declared a state. And at that point there were riots all over the Arab world against this. And the synagogue in Aleppo was burned to the ground. In the process of that, it was felt that the Aleppo Codex had been burned with it and destroyed. But the Aleppo Codex showed up on the black market later on, and it was bought by the Israeli government, and so is now preserved today. Parts of it have were destroyed, but the, the largest section and part of it remains and can be examined by scholars. Um, this is, in fact, a, a, a Aleppo Codex manuscript, a page from Second Chronicles. Now, there are a number of others. There's the Cairo Codex, Codex Chirensis. The Aleppo Codex dates from around 900 to 950 AD. Cairo Codex 895, but the most important is what's called the Codex Leningrad. Codex Leningrad is just the Latinization of the, of the they, they, they say it in Latin, because they like that, uh, which dates from 1008 AD and is preserved today in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. This Codex Leningrad is the standard for all Hebrew Bibles. When we teach Hebrew at, at Denver Seminary, we use Codex Leningrad as our base text. And that's what people learn to read. And that is also the standard for all modern translations. All translations that are based on the Hebrew, which includes probably all the English translations you use, are based on Codex Leningrad. And uh, what the point about it, which is there in bold in the middle, is that 1 Q Isaiah A is remarkably close. That is, the Dead Sea Scroll from 1000, or excuse me, 100 BC is remarkably close to the Isaiah of Leningrad. And 1 Q Isaiah B, which I showed you a picture of a fragment of, is even closer. As I said, just a, less than a dozen words uh, difference in terms of words added and subtracted. Though they are separated from Leningrad, Codex Leningrad, by a thousand years. Now that's a tremendous witness, as I say, I know of no pre-printing press manuscript that has that kind of accuracy. And it's thanks to people like the Master Reads with the care with which they copied it. And you can see even here some uh, notes in the margins and uh, above and below uh, of uh, preserving the accuracy of the manuscript. So, as I, so my point here, and it's a very important one, is that where it can be checked, in terms of the Hebrew text, over a thousand years of copy, it's absolutely accurate. It's as accurate as, uh, it, it's unbelievably accurate from a, from a standpoint of a, of a human endeavor. And that gives us confidence to extrapolate back before 100 BC in the centuries where we don't have manuscripts and manuscript evidence to understand that where we can, if where we can check it, it is accurate and reliable. Then where we extrapolate back, the accuracy and reliability uh, would arguably have continued from the very time it was written down. And it remains for, uh, and the burden of proof, in my view, lies upon a person who wants to argue against that. Because we have such accurate texts and manuscripts. Um, and that, I think, is, is the great witness here of the Hebrew copy. Now, I'll just take a few minutes and, and talk a little bit about the Septuagint, which you remember I said was the Greek translation of the Bible. The Septuagint was uh, translated in Greek about 275 down to 200 uh, BC, probably looks like numbers in Deuteronomy around 275 BC. Uh, this is a text, the earliest texts we have again are from Egypt, another very dry country that preserves the papyrus there. And this uh, is part of a collection that was found in the 19th century and purchased by Chester Beattie, who was an industrialist, uh, who actually made some of his money, I think, here in Colorado at one point, moved over to England and uh, was dissatisfied with that and wound up in Ireland. And so the Chester Beatty collection is actually in, uh, in a separate museum now in Dublin. But uh, this is one of the earliest Old Testament manuscripts that we have in text from around uh, 200, uh, 150 AD, and it is written in uh, the Greek trans 
translation. Um, and what we have is, in the Greek, we have a number of little bitty texts like this. We have some of the texts that are cited uh, by the New Testament and the early church writers. Uh, but we don't have whole manuscripts so much in the early Christian centuries preserved for us. Uh, but we do know that it was used, the Septuagint was used. The most famous early Christian biblical scholar was a man by the name of Origen. And he did a lot of biblical scholarship, that's all he did, uh, pretty much, and interpretation. He lived <coughs> in a town along the coast of, modern-day coast of Israel called Caesarea. And he worked there around uh, 200 AD. And he did something that nobody else did. He created a, a copy of the Bible, the Old Testament, in six columns. Now, six in Latin is hex. Uh, and so it's called the hexagon of the six columns. And in the first column, he wrote simply the Hebrew text that he had received. In the second column, he wrote, a, he wrote what that text sounded like if you read it in Hebrew. So, uh, Genesis 1-1, he would not write the translation in, in Greek in the second column, but he would write the words, uh, the sounds, Bereshi, Baralim, Metashamayim, Metaharis. That's what he would write out in the second column, not the translation, but simply in Greek what it sounded like. In the third column, he wrote the translation from Hebrew into Greek by a man named Aquila a few generations or decades before or origins, early 2nd century AD, perhaps. In the fourth column, he wrote another translation of the, of the Septuagint by another Jewish scholar in the Greek, Symmachus. In the fifth column, he wrote the actual Septuagint that he had. And in the sixth column, he wrote another translation by another Jewish scholar in the Greek. So the first column was Hebrew, and the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth were all Greek. But the fifth column is the one that's really important because it's got the Septuagint in it. Now this was a huge book written around 200 AD. In 400 AD, another church, another early Christian scholar by the name of Jerome claims to have seen the book. He did. But nobody ever took the time to copy the whole thing because it's such a huge book. And so it gradually disappeared. And today we only have fragments of it and a translation of a large part of it into another language called Syriac. And so we really don't have it preserved very much, a little bit, but if we had more, we would be great. What do we have? Well, we have the earliest Bibles in the world that still exist. And uh, I'll just mention these, and then we'll close, and then we have some time for conversation. Uh, at St. Catherine's Monastery, at the traditional site of Mount Sinai in the uh, Sinai Desert today, which is controlled by the country of Egypt, Southern Sinai Desert. There's a little site called St. Catherine's Monastery. This was built in the 6th century by the Emperor Justinian. He ordered it to be built to commemorate the place where Moses had uh, received the law from God on that mountain. And today it is uh, still occupied by monks there, uh, including one, uh, this, is in, this is called St. Catherine's, the actual monastery, including one who's digitalizing all of the, uh, all the manuscripts and putting them on the internet, which is great. But uh, in the 19th century, a man who collected ancient manuscripts by the name of John Tischendorf went to this, uh, this uh, monastery, and the one thing everybody agrees upon is when he left, he had one of the earliest Bibles with him, today called Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, this is an actual picture of it. Let me explain. Uh, as far as he was concerned, if you, if you read his story, he said the monks were using pages of this to start their fires. And so he rescued the manuscript. Uh, the monks say he borrowed it and never returned it. Um, so there's a, a dispute about this. In any case, it wound up in the British uh, collection in the British Museum, and today is in the, in the British Library. Uh, where you can see it. This is a nicer page, actually, from it. It's all in Greek, all capital letters. If you've ever had Greek, you know that when you read Greek uh, texts, you usually have periods, or stops, and things like this, and it's small case letters, except the beginning of sentences or proper names. But the, this, is, uh, this is how they wrote 
It's all in capital letters, and it is from the 4th century AD, from Sinai, it is one of the two earliest complete copies of the Old Testament and the New Testament, because it includes the New Testament, in the Greek. And uh, this is one of the earliest Bibles. The other earliest Bible is in the Vatican Library in Rome, and it's called Codex Vaticanus for that reason. It is from also from the 4th century AD. These books were probably written around the time when Constantine Christianized the Roman Empire and declared Christianity a legal religion and allowed people to work and produce books like this. In fact, we know about that time he uh, ordered the creation of 50 new churches in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And according to the church historian at that time, recording it said, in each of these churches a Bible should be placed. Now that was very unusual because a Bible took forever to copy. I mean, it took years for one scribe to work on one of these and actually make it. Uh, but it is possible that Codex Vaticanus is one of those that was produced and uh, one of those 50. We don't know. But sometime in the fourth century, it was created. And it is the oldest clean manuscript. Codex, uh, the one from Sinai, Codex Sinaiticus, has a lot of corrections and other things in it. That Iconis does not have so much. Uh, and, and therefore, these are the oldest Bibles, complete Bibles that we have. They are also the oldest uh, books of any sort, anywhere in the world, that are actual books. Uh, and we have uh, at Denver Seminary in the library a facsimile of this is on display. There were a couple, in 1999, there were several hundred facsimiles made of Codex Vaticanus, and one of our donors has uh, put it on indefinite loan uh, to the library at Denver Seminary. And occasionally, if you're ever interested, I give tours and of uh, that uh, manuscript and we look at it and talk about it because it is such a fascinating relic and such a a witness to the importance of the Bible uh, from early Christianity on. Well, there are later, uh, from the 5th century, uh, texts like Codex Alexandrine, I don't have a good uh, a picture of that, because you're not allowed to take those pictures, and uh, Codex Washington, which maybe is around that time too, preserves some things, and then the Greek, uh, other Greek manuscripts from later centuries uh, continued the tradition of the Greek translation. And of course, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Greek translation of the Bible is considered the inspired uh, version of the Old Testament. And so it is still used today, uh, known as the Septuagint, as I mentioned. Now, other translations of the Bible were made, and there are early manuscripts in other languages. Uh, one early Christian man, uh, uh, language that was used is called Syriac, which is a uh, which is the Aramaic like Jesus. In his time, they spoke Aramaic, and there's a group of Christians who converted to Christianity early on in the early centuries who uh, developed their own script, and uh, these are some of the early Syriac manuscripts from around the 5th and 6th centuries AD, including this one, which is a, preserves some of Origen's example that I mentioned. So it gets real complicated after this and uh, with hundreds of thousands of manuscripts and lots of details. Um, some of the early manuscripts include those of Coptic, from Egypt and Ethiopic, from Ethiopia, Armenian, from Armenia, and uh, where the Armenians settled in Arabic. Uh, but uh, these are some of the most important ones, and I want to leave you and impress upon you with the question, can we trust the Old Testament? Yes, we have the data where we can check it, that's not everywhere, but from the Dead Sea Scrolls up to the Masterpiece is over a thousand years. And where we can check it, we find that these key texts, like Isaiah, are word for word preserved with accuracy for us. And so as far as we can check it and determine it, uh, and obviously the Masterpiece did not have a copy of the Dead Sea Scroll in front of them. They didn't know about the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was buried and forgotten until 1947. So where we can check it, we have independent verification of the accuracy and reliability of the Old Testament and its manuscripts. Thank you. At this point, I'll, I'll uh, close and we'll open it up.